Blessed be our God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which they had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By our perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Let us pray the psalm in unison. My God, why have you forsaken me? And thou art so far from my cry, and from the words of my distress. O my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trust us. 
mouth is dried out like a posture. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you have laid me in the dust of the grave. Cast the dogs, Jesus, in it, and gangs of evildoers circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet, and I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They can cast lots around my clothing. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword. My life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. My wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. For he does not despise or bore the glory of the heart. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The Lord shall be to be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. Yea, in our heart and forever. All the enemies of the earth shall remember and return to the Lord the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For the truth shall belong to the Lord, he rules those of the nations. To him alone all who seek the earth and bow down to the earth, all who go down to the dust shall fall before him. My soul shall live for him, my descendants shall live for him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and be known to the people that have been born. The same deeds that they have done. A reading of the letter from Paul to the Ephesians. <clears throat> blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us, with all wisdom and insight, he has made us known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, 
came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus answered. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fill, fulfill the word that he had spoken. I do not lose a single one of those who you, whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, the Roman tribune, and the temple police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Anas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was one who had advised that it was better to have one person die for the people then the Romans come and destroy both the holy place and the nation. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I have said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of the disciples, are you? Peter denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then the chief priests took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. Pilate went out to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? They answered, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The chief priests replied, We are not This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, 
my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So are you a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the chief priests again and told them, You have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to the chief priests, Look, I am bringing him out to you. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. But the chief priests cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be the king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the chief priests, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the, the cross of Jesus were his mother 
and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to, to, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a, great, a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Good evening, and welcome to St. Matthew's Good Friday service. Please be seated. So this is by far the most solemn of all the services that we have during the year, isn't it? When we read this Gospel of John, we begin to think about all of the concepts which come to our mind. What is it that we're really here to learn conceptually. What's that framework? Love, 
anger, jealousy, and many others. But the one I wish to focus on tonight is sacrifice. You know, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is an example of the greatest sacrifice. We have all types of images running through our minds, don't we? And we, I know for me, those images have changed as my days have increased. C.S. Lewis is an author who I just love, and he states, and I quote, he is, especially on this day, the epitome, the very definition of love and sacrifice. Love incarnate, love lived, love crucified, love resurrected. Today, Christ says to his church and all dear sinners, how do I love thee? Let me count the way. I was born, I grew in wisdom and knowledge, you did. I learned from my parents the scriptures. I walked in your shoes, in the very soles of your own flesh. I know your pain. I know your disease. I know your temptation. Even greater than you can ever imagine, I know your sin. And most of all, today, I know your death. But that is not all I know about you. I know that you are love, unending. And for you, I go down to create and fill the very word, love, with my own flesh and blood. Never will this word mean anything greater than what I am and I have done for you. This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the proposition for our sins. What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear our dreadful curse. Good Friday is, quite simply, the cleanest picture of who God is for you, love himself. God who needs nothing, loves into existence wholly, superfluous creatures in order that he may love and perfect them. He creates the universe already foreseeing, or should we say seeing, that there is no tense in God. The buzzing sound and cloud of flies about the cross, the flayed black pressed against the uneven stake, the nails driven through the mesial nerves, the repeated incipient suffocation as the body droops, the repeated torture of back and an arms and a time after time for breath's sake, hitched up, if I may dare, the biological image, God is host, who deliberately creates his own parasites and causes to be that which may be exploited and take advantage of him. Herein is love. This is the diagram of love himself, the inventor of love. We think of the sacrifice that Christ made for us and for our salvation. And it's all in the Good Friday images, thoughts and recounting of all the intense events leading up to the Christ being crucified on the cross and dying for our sins. For Christ newly, truly knew the significance and the sacrifice that he would have to make and demonstrate for all of the Christians reconciling their own lives. And then the sacrifices that each of us have made in our own individual lives, made over the last two millennia since Christ provided the ultimate sacrifice to us and to God and fulfilling the scripture. I can't help but wonder what really must have been going through Christ's mind as all these events began and ended up on Good Friday, ending with being crucified next to the two criminals. Marcus Borg wrote an amazing book called The Last Week. Borg recounts the betrayal of the Jews into disdain of the Jewish leadership established society. He provides an excellent landscape of what was occurring 
the last days of Christ during Holy Week. But one thing that we know is that Pontius Pilate tried, and by Herod also, brought in their own legion. It was a demonstration of the um, emperor's power at the same time Christ was entering in his, in his uh, meager cult. And I think that procession leaving Pontius Pilate's palace to go to a place where Christ would ultimately be sacrificed and carried for the cross for all of us until he could and more being assisted by Simon, who was able to take and bear that cross for him, all being witnessed by the people, by the Jews, and by the Romans that had gathered. But having also been taken to the brink of death by every horrible Roman capacity for torture and for death, continually being beaten with chains and whips, and being paraded and driven through the streets of Jerusalem, being rejected and isolated, that of a hardened criminal. For it's all these actions that Christ was drawn and put to death in the most cruel and humane way that Rome could kill another human being, and that was by crucifixion. For the cross that we adore and we bear to represent Christ's life was really a... Um, is really the, the worst possible uh, sentence that a human being could have to be crucified uh, 2,024 2, years ago. But Christ lifted that. The love of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he gave us demonstrated that Christ did die for us. He died for our sins. He died that we might be able to have life in our endemic human condition. What the Roman guards witnessed, what the centurion witnessed, and what all of the other people that gathered there witnessed was nothing short of God's love in action. I think of Mary and seeing her son being taken through the town, and she stayed with him, as did Mary Madeline through the entire event and was there at Golgotha. And what a sacrifice, a true mother sacrifice that Mary was able to give her son. So in this, in this concept of sacrifice, we have this thing called salvation. You and me are steadfast witnesses tonight, recounting the events of tonight's crucifixion and we are there. Paul says that our salvation is free, but we know that it's anything but cheap. It's the price that was really paid from the events that we recount tonight, that we contemplate tonight's crucifixion and the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The ultimate sacrifice for us. For one, I am reflecting all this week, driving all sorts of events, up to tonight, bring myself together a greater understanding and the love of Christ for each one of us. It's a special love. The reason that tonight is called back Black Friday is this was the final act, the great sacrifice. Jesus being able to proclaim the good news from that cross. We see many instances of sacrifice in our own lives, in our own lives. We all sacrifice in one way or another. But we see the sacrifices of veterans, first responders, medical professionals, teachers, priests, mothers, and fathers, for it is sacrificing for others. Our individual lives are given deeper meaning. Our own souls and spirits are fed with a Christ quenching thirst, being delivered by the Holy Spirit. Think about the sacrifices that you have made for your own individual lives, for your children, your grandchildren, your parents, your sisters, your friends. Now reflect on those sacrifices. Affect the love of one another. Someone maybe that you sacrificed that you didn't even know. And what was the outcome and the recipient of your sacrifice? It was love. Sometimes the results of sacrifices aren't even known in our lifetime, 
But hear this, my friends, tonight. The Holy Spirit knows. Christ knows. God knows our sacrifices. Fills our soul and spirit with the thirst of quenching salvation. For sacrifice could only be known to us and does not get advertised on social media. And then we approach our very end in that final day that we may give in the life of Jesus Christ salvation to our end. And when we meet again in Christ to give thanks to the great sacrifices that Christ gave and for the blessing and the gifts in our own lives given, I cannot think of any other time other than Good Friday that I want to bend my knees and look at the cross and look for what it really represents, a death so terrible that it transferred to modern time, to the love of Christ's sacrifice for us. For we have our Christ on the walls of our homes and on our bodies, different crosses made of different materials, different types, but all representing the same, a sacrifice for the whole world. Please kneel or be seated as you're able.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Jewish people who possess an internal covenant with the Lord, who delivered them from bondage to freedom, for continued faithfulness to God's covenant with them, for their flourishing and peace as witness to God's sustaining love, for safety from all malice and harm, for the fullness of redemption for the sake of God's name, that unity and concord may exist between Israel and the church, Jews and Gentiles in obedience to God's will. God of Abraham, you planted your people Israel as the root and grafted us as wild branches into a single olive tree of praise to you. As we come near to the cross, we lament the history of prejudice and violence we have fomented between ourselves and your faithful people of whom Jesus was born. Bless the children of your covenant, Jew and Gentile alike, as we strive together to attain the fullness of your blessing for the world. Amen. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity and witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for our Jennifer, our bishop, and for all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, and for those who are persecuted for the sake of Christ, that God will confirm the church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray for those who have not embraced Christ's redemptive love, for those who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have been wounded by the people of Christ, for those who have persecuted others in the name of Christ, for those who have lost their faith, for those without faith, for those hardened by sin and indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, that God will lead sinners to repentance and sustain all in a life of faith and obedience. Merciful God, the source of life and fountain of mercy, let the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, be preached with grace and power. Turn the hearts of the followers of Jesus who have harmed others in his name. Lead us to repentance and amendment of life and sustain by your loving grace all who lift their eyes to you. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority, among them for Joe, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, 
that by God's help, they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for those who are hungry and homeless, destitute and oppressed, for those who are ill or disabled in body, mind, or spirit, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for those who are sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners, refugees, and captives, for victims of war, genocide, and trafficking, and all those in mortal danger that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them, grant them the knowledge of his love, and stir up in, the will, stir up in his the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness, the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to, to invite you to come up and reverence the cross um, during the anthem sung by the choir. Um, either kneel or stand or however you feel is appropriate um, to come and venerate.
As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.